Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. We come to another passage of Scripture that is unique to the Gospel of Luke. I've mentioned to you that much of what Luke writes in his Gospel between about chapters 9 through 19 is unique to his gospel, not found in Matthew, Mark, or John. This is one of the stories we're about to read in the first eight verses of chapter 18 that is found only here in the gospel of Luke. And it is a parable. It is a parable that Jesus teaches. For those of you who are new to kind of biblical terminology, a parable is basically an illustration drawn from everyday life to communicate a deeper spiritual or moral truth. And Jesus often employed this tool of communication. He would use a parable to teach, to help his hearers, you know, um, stretch in their understanding of something that was deeper. And, and so what we're about to read here is a parable. A lot of times when Jesus would teach a parable, he would teach it intentionally with the idea of causing people to have to think more intently and to read between the lines. Now, what I love about this particular parable is that before Jesus teaches it, Luke gives us the, the point of the parable, the purpose of the parable right at the beginning, which, which I like, because I'm the guy that had trouble in school with reading comprehension, like, because my mind wanders. So like I'm reading something, I have to read it and reread it and read it again, because I'm, I'm off in other places in my head. I'm more of an auditory learner. So for me, I love the way that Luke does this, because if you look in your Bibles here at chapter 18, verse 1, Luke says, then he, that's Jesus, spoke a parable to them, and then here it is, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. He tells us right up front, here's the purpose behind the parable that you're about to hear, that Jesus wants to encourage us, us he encourages us to pray and to keep on praying and to not be discouraged. And so here we go, verse 2, Jesus says, there was, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me for my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her. In other words, I'll, I'll, I'll get justice for her. Lest by her continual coming she weary me. Okay, so that's the whole parable. Now look at what Jesus said, verse 6. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? In other words, you know, God's so patient with us. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth. Now, in the original Greek language, there's a direct article, the, in front of faith that Jesus actually says, will he find the faith on the earth? In other words, this kind of faith that he's talking about, people who are persistent in prayer and seeking God, will he find this kind of faith on earth? So, we'll take a look at this parable today. Now, I know some of you are already like, oh, it's a story, it's going to be a Bible teaching about how I need to be praying more. Great, you know, and already you feel like, oh, I'm not doing it, so now he's going to hammer me about this. Hey, hey, try to preach it, okay? It's even more difficult for me. <laughs> but this is where we are, and this is the only, uh, this is a story only found in Luke's gospel, so it's good for us. So, it's not always ice cream, friends. Sometimes it is broccoli. All right. <laughs> Lord, thanks for this time in your word, and we're all going to be stretched in this area of prayer, because I dare say probably most of us don't do it enough. But we thank you, Lord, for this reminder in your word that we should not only pray, but be persistent in our prayers. And so, Lord, stretch us and help us, and, and that we might grow in this, in this area, Lord. Not, not because it's a burden, but because it's a blessing to commune and connect with the heart of God. And so bless our Bible study now, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So I'll open up with this little poem for you. The proper way for a man to pray, said Deacon Lemuel Keyes, the only proper attitude is down upon his knees. Nay, I should say the way to pray, said Reverend Dr. Wise, is standing straight with outstretched arms, with rapt and upturned eyes. Oh, no, 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 said Elder Snow. 
Such posture is too proud. A man should pray with eyes fast closed and head contritely bowed. It seems to me his hands should be austerely clasped in front with both thumbs pointing toward the ground, said Reverend Dr. Blunt. Last year, I fell in Hodgkin's well head first, said Cyril Brown, with both my heels a sticking up, my head a pointing down. And I done prayed right there and then, best prayer I ever said, the prayingest prayer I ever prayed, a standing on me head. <laughs> Most of the time when it comes to the topic of prayer, we're more concerned about the posture of prayer, especially those who are new to the faith. People who don't know, is it, is it right to pray with your eyes open, eyes shut? Should I stand, should I sit? Hands folded, hands raised. What's the proper posture? I remember years ago when I was a teenager, before I even got saved, I was with a friend at a Catholic service, Catholic mass. Those of you with Catholic backgrounds, man, you got a lot going on in your Catholic church service. It's like, whoa, recite this, recite that, stand up, sit down, kneel. It was one of the churches that had this kneeling bench and it would roll down in front of you. And there were different times when all of a sudden people just knew the signal and that, down on your knees on the little bench you went, like all in unison. And I'm like, what's going on here? And I, I didn't understand all the hand motions and who's calling the plays. And, you know, and I, I, didn't, I, didn't know, I didn't know the playbook. And I felt like really out of place here. Well, you know, look, um, I can just tell you that God is not nearly as concerned about your prayer posture as he is your prayer persistence. And that's what this parable is all about. It's about being persistent in our prayer life. Again, verse 1 tells us that Jesus spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. The purpose of this parable is to encourage us to pray and to keep on praying and to not become discouraged if our prayers are not immediately answered. In a word, Jesus is telling us to be Persistent, persistent. Now, not all persistence is good, okay? Uh, example, um, if, you, if you've been dating somebody and they break up with you and you continue to persist to call that person, to text that person, you're blowing up their phone, you're showing up at their house uninvited, unannounced, that's not persistence, that's called stalking, okay? <laughs> Stop that, they broke up with you, move on. It's also, you know, I don't like the kind of persistence when you go into a, you know, a, you're, you're trying to buy a car. You step onto the car lot and some salesman is on you like butter on toast. It's like, you know, that, I don't like that kind of persistence. Give me some room. I'm just looking, right? You ever said that to somebody, some, you know, really heavy handed salesman? Like, I'm just looking, like back off. I'm just looking. Oh, you go to Cornerstone? Oh, okay. All right. I'll be nice. Uh, <laughs> But then there's the type of persistence that Jesus talks about here where he encourages you to pray and to not give up, to be persistent in prayer. And so he uses this example in this parable drawn from everyday life. He talks about a woman and this woman in particular happens to be a widow and she was seeking justice for some wrong treatment that she has received. We don't know what it is, but this mistreatment by some adversary or some opponent she needs justice for. So she's appealing to a judge in a court of law. And the judge in the story, uh, we know only two things about him and both things are not good. It tells us in verse two that he did not fear God and he did not regard man. In other words, he didn't respect people. So he didn't fear God and he didn't respect people. Well, those are, those are like the two main criteria for being a judge. You need to fear God. You need to care about people. So he's O for two. And um, because he doesn't fear God, it means that he does, he does not believe in a higher moral authority, which, which means in essence that he thinks he's a law unto himself. So he can just decide whatever he wants to decide without any real regard or reverence for God. And that makes for a very dangerous judge, a very arrogant judge who just rules however he or she wants. And on top of that, he doesn't respect people in this parable. And so if you were victimized, he doesn't care. If you were wronged, he doesn't care. If you were robbed, he doesn't care. 
I mean, if it doesn't affect him, why should he care about you? And so that's this guy, that's this judge that this dear widow is appealing to. And because of the way this guy is, without fear of God, without caring about people, it's the reason why Jesus calls him an unjust judge in verse 6. But the more that this judge dismissed this woman, like, I don't even hear your case, like, you know, please uh, go away. The more that he dismissed her, the more persistent she became. You know, she's, he's coming out of his house in the morning and, and uh, with his cup of coffee on the way to, to the courtroom. And there she is. Judge, I, can we talk about my case? Not now. And he takes a lunch break and he's walking in downtown to get a sandwich. Somewhere. Judge, it's me again. Can we talk about my case? Not now. I don't want to talk about this anymore. And so she just wears this guy down. She's just constantly in his face. She's badgering him. She continues to just, you know, uh, uh, appeal to the court, appeal to him. She's persistent. She's petitioning him over and over again. And finally, the judge says, you know, I don't really care about people. I don't fear God. But verse five, but because this widow troubles me, you know, like just to get her off my back, I will avenge her. Okay, I'll get justice for her, lest by her continual coming, she weary me. He's like, I'm weary of this. He basically says, this old lady's wearing me out. I can't take another day of this. I'm sick and tired of this. So because of all the nagging, I'm just going to grant her request. Okay, so that's the parable. And then Jesus says in verses 6 and 7, then he said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? though he bears long with them. You know, we have a patient God. He loves us. And so will he not also give us justice when we cry out to him day and night, and day and night, and day and night? Now, some people have a hard time with this parable. And the reason that some have a hard time with this parable is because they interpret it incorrectly. And they look at this parable and they basically think that Jesus is comparing us to the widow and God to this unjust judge. And that the idea, they think, is that if we just wear God down enough with our constant nagging about something, then he will eventually give us what we want. You know, kind of like the way that some children are with parents. And some kids are just like, I want ice cream, I want ice cream, I want ice cream, I want ice cream. I want ice cream. No, you can't have an ice cream. I want ice cream. I want ice cream. No, you can't. I want ice cream. Okay, fine. And then you cave in. Why? Because they're just nagging you until they wear you down. And they're like, okay, I guess I'll give you the ice cream now. This is not how the parable is supposed to be interpreted. Because the parable is not primarily a parable of comparison. The parable is primarily a parable of contrast of contrast. In the first place, God would never be referenced to someone who is unjust. And in the second place, this is, uh, again, not a parable of comparison. It is a parable of contrast. And so what you have here is this woman who is a widow. And as a widow, she is in one of the most disadvantaged classes of society at this time. Very poor, um, doesn't have anything as a widow. And Jesus intentionally chooses a person of this kind of social status to show her desperation. And she's crying out to this judge. This judge hears her request over and over again, dismisses her, dismisses her, dismisses her, until finally he gives her justice. The point of the parable is that if an unjust, uncaring judge would do for this poor, lowly widow what he did. How much more will a caring, loving Father in heaven do for you and me? That's his point, which is why we need to be persistent in prayer. Because our Father in heaven delights to do good for his children. This is a parable of contrast. Now, the very fact that this is a parable, though, that challenges us to be persistent implies what? Well, it implies that we won't always get what we want when we want it from God. Otherwise, why would Jesus teach this parable? It's like if, if every time we prayed about something and we got what we wanted when we wanted it, Jesus would have no reason to exhort us. Keep on praying. Hang in there. 
So the very reason that he's teaching this parable is because when we pray, we will not always get what we want. I mean, isn't that what the prophet Mick Jagger said, right? <laughs> you won't always get what you want. Okay. Now, if you're new to Cornerstone, he's not really a prophet. It's my sense of humor, okay? <laughs> Charles Spurgeon, by the way, would get in trouble for kidding around too much in the pulpit. Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher from the uh, 19th century. And uh, so his elders went up to Spurgeon once and said, you know, you got to stop being so funny in the pulpit. And he said to them, if you only knew how much I was holding back, you would commend me. <laughs> That's how I feel sometimes. But anyway, okay. So, you won't always get what you want, but sometimes you'll get what you need. That's true in life. That's true in a song. That's true with God. We won't always get what we want. And we certainly won't always get it when we want it, which is why he's telling us here to be persistent in prayer. Don't give up. Keep praying even though you don't get immediate answers. But then the question becomes, well, so why? Why not? You know, why, why do we need to be persistent? You know, why is it that God doesn't just give us as we ask what we want and when we want it? So I'm going to give you three quick reasons because these are important reasons why we need to be persistent in prayer. Why should we be persistent in prayer? Because number one, maybe it's not His will. Maybe it's not His will and we don't know. So we keep praying and we keep praying and we keep praying until we know one way or another. Look, God has a will for your life. God has a perfect will for your life. You also have a will for your life. I mean, we, we do. We, we have a certain desire about our lives, and we have a certain, perhaps, goals about our lives. We have certain wishes about our lives. We have, certain, we have a will, and God has a will. And sometimes those things are aligned, and sometimes they're not. Usually they're not, to be honest with you. Because we usually are wanting things that are more selfish and fleshly, and God's wanting things that are more perfect and spiritual. Well, what happens when those things are not aligned is God's will will always prevail. So the question is, the issue is, how quickly will I discern His will to join in on what His will is for my life? Because the longer it takes me to discern that and join in with God's perfect will for my life, the more miserable I'm going to be. The longer it takes for me to surrender, to discern the will of God and surrender my life to His will, if that takes a long period of time, I'm going to be miserable, which is why we need to persist in prayer because we don't always know. I don't know sometimes if my wishes are aligned with what God's desire is for my life. So I have to keep praying and keep praying and keep praying. I have to be persistent about it. Look, it's not a bad thing to say sometimes your will is different from God's. It just is important to understand that they have to be aligned. Remember that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus had a different will from the Father. I mean, He did. When He's praying just before He's crucified, He's, he's anticipating the agony of the cross, the suffering of the cross. Luke's Gospel tells us that when He is praying there in the Garden of Gethsemane under such excruciating agony, He sweats droplets of blood. It's hematidrosis. It's, it's when little capillaries of your forehead break and the blood mingles with the sweat. He was perspiring blood because He was under such excruciating agony thinking about the cross. And in Matthew 26, 39, Jesus prays and He says, O Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, the cup he's referring to is the cup of suffering. And Jesus was basically saying that my will, he's basically saying my will is if there is some other way to accomplish the plan of redemption without my going to the cross, that would be my preference. But, nevertheless, your will be done, not mine. And so he surrendered his will to the will of the Father. And that's what we have to be about. And that takes prayer. And that takes persistent prayer. Because I don't always know. You don't always know. So I have to be praying and praying and praying and understanding what is God's will. And how can I align my will, bend my will to the will of God. Prayer is not trying to get God to bend His will to yours. Prayer is bending your will to the will of God. E. Stanley Jones said it this way, quote, Prayer is surrender. Surrender to the will of God and cooperation with that will. He said, if I throw out a boat hook from a boat and catch hold of the shore and pull, do I pull the shore to me 
or do I pull myself to the shore? Prayer is not pulling God to my will, but the aligning of my will to the will of God. That's what prayer is. So we have to be persistent in prayer because it may not be God's will, and we don't know until we keep praying and praying it through. The second reason why we need to be persistent is because maybe it's not his timing. I tell people all the time, you might want something that God wants. In other words, you might discern God's will properly, but it's not only knowing the what of God's will, it's also knowing the when of God's will. We have to get the timing right as much as we have to get the what part right. And God's timing is often different from ours. You know, look at Moses. Moses, Moses knew that he was God's deliverer, that God would raise him up to deliver the Hebrew slaves after 400 years of slavery in Egypt. But he had the timing wrong. He was 40 years off. He was 40 years early. He sees an Egyptian uh, taskmaster beating a Hebrew slave. He intervenes to rescue one of his fellow Hebrews, kills the Egyptian taskmaster, and says that he did it because he thought he was God's deliverer. Well, he was God's deliverer, but he didn't have to go slaughtering all the Egyptian taskmasters. God was going to do it in miraculous ways, and he was 40 years too early. God had to train uh, Moses on the in the backside of the wilderness of Midian for 40 years until he was really ready to be a shepherd who would lead the people out of slavery. He had it, the will right, but he had the timing wrong. You know, Paul, too, the Apostle Paul, when he was on the road to Damascus and had this wonderful encounter with Jesus and got saved and became a believer, he didn't just get up immediately and start preaching the gospel. Do you know that from the time that he was saved at that Damascus Road experience until he first led someone to the Lord, there was 10 years, 10 years that Paul was seeking the Lord and God was working on his heart to prepare him for what he was calling him to do. Think about a number of times too, when Jesus, Jesus knew he was the Messiah, but when people tried to prematurely make him king, what would he say? My time has not yet come. God has a perfect timetable for you. And it might be different from your timetable, but his timing is never early, his timing is never late. God's timing is always perfect. He's always on time. So we have to keep praying because we don't always know what's God's timing with this. What's God's timing? And usually part of praying about God's timing means I have to learn how to wait. And the faster our culture gets with, you know, every, all this technology that has made our world so fast, the more difficult it is to wait on the Lord, isn't it? Because we're all used to, you know, if, if you're 30 seconds in that line from the time you give your order at the box, right? I'll take, I'll take a, a quarter pounder with cheese, hold the onions, give me a medium fries and a Coke. If it's 30 seconds before you get your food, you're like starting to, you know, wig out. You're like, I can't believe this. It's taking 45 seconds. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. And now news at the speed of light, it's coming across your phones, it's coming across your TV constantly. And so we're always exposed to the rapid thing, rapid things, things are always so fast, so fast. And God's like, not me, I'm taking my time and I'm gonna do it my way. And that's why the Bible, you can't, you can't find a bunch of verses where it says, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> you find a bunch of verses in the Bible that says, wait, wait, wait. Like Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. In Micah 7, verse 7, therefore I will look to the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. And so we have to persevere because maybe it's not his will, maybe it's not his timing. Third thing, last thing, maybe it's not his best. You ever think about that? When you're praying for something, and you're like, God, I really want this, I really want this, I really want, and then you're disappointed because it doesn't happen. And you're like, you know, God, why, why, why? Well, because maybe that wasn't his best. You know, so, some of you ladies, you're like, I think I found the stud. I think, I think I found the stud of my life. Yes, this is the stud. And then you're praying, God, please, please, this is the stud. And, and then the guy breaks up with you. And you're like, God, why, why, why? And God's like, because he wasn't a stud, he was a spud, okay? You had the wrong potato. <laughs> 
You have the wrong potato. I have a better stud for you, okay? Just hold on, because that guy was a spud, not a stud. And so you're like, okay, okay. But, but sometimes you, you don't know that in the moment. You know, later you can look back and you're like, thank God, God, re have you ever thought that? Have you ever thought that? Some of you don't want to look around the room, do you? But you're like, <laughs> you've thought that. You've been like, yeah, I, I could have married that dude. And thank God I ended up with this knucklehead. It's a little bit better, you know, a little, little bit, a little bit. God always has his best. Think about what happened in the Gospel of John. Do you remember when Jesus is one of his closest friends, Lazarus had died. And Lazarus has two sisters, Mary and Martha. The Bible says they sent word to Jesus when Lazarus was sick, so, hoping that he would come to heal their sick brother. And when Jesus got word, he just tarried where he was for a few more days while Lazarus died. What kind of a friend is that, you know? But, but Jesus knew, see, there's going to be a more perfect plan here. And God's going to get even more glory. So that by the time Jesus shows up, Lazarus had been dead a few days, and both Mary and Martha independently say to Jesus, it's in John's gospel, they say to him, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Thank you for the greeting. Nice to see you too. But you see, Jesus performed a greater miracle. What was the better thing? To make a sick man well or to make a dead man alive? It was a better thing he came to do. A more glorifying thing he came to do. And sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers, not because he's late. Jesus was perfectly on time. But because maybe what we're praying for is not God's best. So we need to wait and be persistent. Because we don't know any of this in advance, we don't know what God's will is, we don't know what God's timing is, and we don't always know what God's best is, that's why we need to keep Praying with persistence until we find out, until it's clear. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 7, Ask and it will be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. And both, uh, all three of those verbs, ask, seek, and knock, are in the Greek present active imperative, meaning continual action. It literally translates ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. Not because this is a game with God where he's just like folding his arms up in heaven, sitting on the throne like, I'm just going to wait to see how long it finally takes you, you know. It's not some kind of a game to God. We don't know always what God is up to. So it's good for us to be persistent in prayer until God reveals his will, his timing, and his best for us. Be persistent in prayer. Romans 12, 12 says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. The widow's relentless pursuit was rewarded because she didn't give up. And we have more reasons to be motivated than she did. Look at this quick chart of contrast. Here's the widow. Here are believers who trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. Notice, she was appealing to a cold-hearted judge. We are appealing to a warm-hearted father. She approached a court of law. We approach a throne of grace. She got justice, we get mercy. So how much more should we be persistent in pursuing God? He loves us. He cares about us. Prayer is not an obligation. Prayer is an invitation. Prayer is an invitation in its basic definition to commune and connect with God. It is sometimes talking to Him. It is sometimes listening to Him. It can be with words or just from your heart. It can be making requests for yourself or interceding for others. There is no right way to pray. And the only wrong way to pray is if you don't. There is no designated prayer posture. You can stand, you can sit, you can kneel, lift hands, close eyes, open eyes. You can pray on the run. You can pray in public. You can pray in private. You can pray in the morning, pray in the evening, and pray every time in between. But the main thing is be persistent in prayer. Colossians 4, 2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. He spoke a parable to them that man ought always to pray and not lose heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this parable that reminds us to be persistent. We will not always get what we want when we want it. But you are a good God and you are faithful to us as a warm-hearted father 
seated on the throne, always willing and desirous of extending mercy and grace to your children. It is a privilege to come to you in prayer, not an obligation, Lord. You invite us to come to commune with you and to connect with your heart. Forgive us, Lord, when we neglect the privilege of prayer. May we not give up, because we don't always know your will. We don't always know your timing. We don't always know what is your best for us. So we pray, and we keep on praying until those things are clear. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. May we be persistent in seeking you, in drawing near to you. And thank you that you always hear us, Lord. Thank you for being our Father, caring about us. You see everything we're going through. You know every good day and every bad day. And we pray, God, that you would continue to guide us and lead us and love us. We praise you and we worship you. And we love you in response because you first loved us. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you all. Have a great day.